do you have an hour? <laughs> no. Uh, so many good things said uh, by the testimonials and so on. Uh, Charcy's dad was something else. Uh, Lester Sheets was his name. And Brother Sheets uh, was an evangelist that uh, if you were sleeping while he was preaching, he threw a songbook at you. <laughs> he did it lovingly, of course. <laughs> but I, I saw him preaching one time. He was in a, quite a large church in Long Beach, California, and he was preaching the service. And the church was set up to where a, a theater-type church to where the pews were kind of on an angle going down. I meant the platform was probably about eight feet off the ground by the time he got to where the platform was from the lower area. And Dad liked to sometimes emphasize his point by jumping. And he's preaching away, and the church isn't the brightest lighted building, and he's preaching and trying to make his point, and he jumps off the pulpit or the platform. And you could kind of watch his eyes the whole time he was going down in slow motion, <laughs> like... When am I stopping? And he said, boom. I mean, he hit right there and he did, his knees crumbled. He didn't realize how far down it was. And we had to laugh our hearts. And I think he dismissed the service at some point because he just never got it back together again. It was so shocking to him. Uh, that kind of thing. Uh, I had a great dad. Uh, my dad was a, a pastor as well. Uh, my dad was a pastor, it was us three boys, there's three boys, and all of us were pastors. And uh, my brother Richard, some of you have met, he's still pastoring the same church now. He's on his 43rd year oh, at wow. one church in the Cern Valley. If you've ever been in California, the Cern Valley, who could spend 43 years in the Cern Valley? It's on the backside of Big Bear, and it's not the prettiest part of the world. But he loves it, and it's the greatest little church in the world, except for this one's better. Yeah. And I tell him that all the time. Our brother John, uh, you never met, but our brother John passed away a couple of years ago now and was a missionary for years in Japan and also to the servicemen's centers. And it all came from watching our father and minister and dedicate his life and all this watching it. Dad had us boys out on Saturday cutting the grass around the church. We had to wear white shirts and ties while we mowed the lawn. <laughs> we were not allowed to disgrace God's property, our house, by dressing less, even to do yard work. That's the kind of mindset I was raised with. That kind of discipline and honor to God. For him, my dad, to see some of the way some preachers dress today was absolutely, well, I don't know. He would lose his religion, probably. <laughs> so, not that, you know, everybody does their own thing. And today, it's kind of hang loose, but whatever. I'm just waiting one of these days to come with holes in my jeans and see what you guys say. So, <laughs> and those kinds of things. Wow. Just give me a few moments, okay? I promise I will just take a few moments. There's so many wonderful things that have been shared. But I mentioned, and I titled this message today is uh, The Challenges. Fatherhood has its challenges. And the challenges that we, uh, as men today, need to face. Now, I have fathers here today, but I also have men here today. And I am so proud of the fact that we have such a high percentage of attendance in men. Most churches are made up of ladies. Yeah. And ladies, we are grateful for you. We couldn't make it without you. Yeah. But I am so grateful that we have so many men that are willing to uh, serve God, come to church, and discipline themselves in this area of fatherhood or manhood. It all has its challenges. When did it all begin? Well, it all began back in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, when God said, let us make man after our own image. And God made man so that man would rule over the earth. We emphasize the scripture that man was created so he would rule over the earth. All animal kingdoms, 
except for the scriptures that has it right there in Genesis. I'm not going there to read it all. You can read it for yourself, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, through several verses. That's where it really began. But a lot of you men, your responsibilities, your ladies, forgive me, I'm going to talk mostly to the men here this morning. Your responsibilities begin at a time when you were in a service or some kind of a special place and somebody started off with these kinds of words. Dearly beloved, we are here gathered together the friends of God and these witnesses to bring together this man and this woman in the bounds of holy matrimony. When those words are spoken, responsibility hit. Man. We were created to rule when it comes to the marriage vows. We are reminded what we are to rule and our responsibility in the area of the challenges that we have in being all that we're supposed to be as a husband, as a father, and as a man in particular. There's several things in our lives when we see those vows, you know, vows like this, uh, will you love her, comfort her, honor, and keep her in sickness and in health, and forsaking all others, keep yourself only unto her, so long as you both shall live? Those are challenges that every man in a marriage vow makes and accepts those responsibilities. As a father, those are carried over into our relationship with the children that are born into that marriage or into that relationship. And those same challenges continue on in that relationship. This message today, I'd like to have the goals for today is to acknowledge my responsibilities as a father or as a man in this world today. That is your number one goal that we would like to gather from the testimonies that have been given, the words that have been spoken, is to acknowledge I have responsibilities. I have made vows. I have made a commitment. And God himself has made me for a purpose to rule. Am I living up to it? Am I accepting it? Am I being all that I should be? Goal number two of this short message that we're going to share with you today. As a father, a man, I'll work on the areas of my life to be all God has purposed me to be. To work on those areas. None of us have arrived at the place where we'd like to be, probably. If I were asked for any perfect man or father, husband, to stand today, it would probably be impossible for any of us to stand it may surprise you, but I'm not perfect. <laughs> Honey. I'm supposed to say something. It says so right here. My Charles is supposed to respond with, Honey, not you. You're perfect. And something like the third goal today is to see the need to keep your home safe and built on godly principles. If anything, the world needs today are homes that are secure and our foundation, our homes built on foundations that are biblical and God-approved. In our lives, we need that. And so today, when we look at the scripture, I'm going to have you look at Philippians chapter 1, first of all, which is in your bulletin as well. And you can see what Paul is saying to the church at Philippi to help us Meet the goals are the areas of and challenges in our life. So let's look at this. It says in verse 4, In all my prayers, chapter 1, In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with God and with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ. Now all men, within the sound of my voice, hear this word. God has begun a good work in 
you. Turn to somebody and tell them, God's working in me. A good work. He has a good work. He wants to make you better than you were. He wants to bring you to the next level in your life. And he wants you to understand what life is all about and the challenges that you have. Fatherhood has its challenges. And it asks this question. How do you see yourself today? How does your family or your spouse see you? How does God see you? How does God want you to see yourself? All these are questions that we ask ourselves frequently in this area of being a man, being a father, being all that I want to be. And know that God is working a good work in me and he's going to complete the work in me when it's done. That's exciting. There's five things real quick I want to share with you. Real quick. First one is, out of Ephesians chapter 4, and let's go to, excuse me, I said Ephesians, Philippians chapter 4, and let's go over to verse 4. And I'm going to start reading there, and I want to highlight some things that have to take place in our lives. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. <clears throat> Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard yourself, your hearts, and your minds in Christ Jesus. Let's pause the reading there for a moment. Because the five things that I want to share with you today are, number one, Every man needs to be a participant in his home. Yes. He needs to be present in his home. Yes. It is possible to be in your home and not be present in your home. I'm going to dig a little deep, so hang on with me, all right? Participation in home is important. As some of you said, when dad would do certain things with you and all the activity that you have, etc. My dad was a great dad in the sense that he would uh, be with us boys all the time. He, played, he showed us how to play horseshoes. We had horseshoe pits everywhere we lived. And he wanted to beat us every time. Ringer after ringer, you know I mean? We were raised that way. But participating in your home is so vitally important. Knowing that you are there, not only physically, but you're there emotionally in your home. That you are present in the sense that if somebody needs you, you can respond to them from your heart and from your mind and from your soul that God has given you. Don't leave it just up to your wife or your spouse. Don't leave it up to just someone else to raise your kids. You be the participant. You be present in their life. You make the changes in their life that need to be done. Give them the wisdom that comes from God into your life. So important that we do that. If you turn with me real quick over to Romans, Romans chapter 12, and let's look at this scripture, because it gives us the information that we need on how to participate in our families, how we are there present in their lives. How we are being the spiritual leader that God wants us to be. If you go to chapter uh, 12 of the book of Romans, let's go to verse 6. I'm going to read several scriptures. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. So the question I asked you just a moment ago, how do you see yourself? How do you see yourself? You have been gifted by God. In some area. Every man present here in this service today, you have been gifted by God. And it says here we have different gifts. Isn't that great that we have men in our church that are capable of doing so many things? I think it's marvelous. If we need to have certain things fixed, we can make a few phone calls, it's being done. We need concrete work done. We have concrete people. If we need gravel, we know where to go for gravel. <laughs> Ask Charlie for gravel. Okay. Our Ken Bird for gravel. Our concrete. 
or somebody do electricity. Gary's not here this morning, but Gary does our electrical and other people do carpentry and everybody. People just do a variety of things. Ask Bob to do something. Boy, Bob's on a bomb. Present us back there. He can do basically anything. I think. And he's a jack of all trades. Tremendous. The men, all of you have certain gifts and abilities. This is helping you participate in your home. You participate with the gift that you've been given. And in your home, it would be missing if your gift wasn't present. You hear what I just said? Your home is missing something if you're not present with your gift. Amen. It's important that we recognize that. And it's given by the grace of God is given to us. If a man's gift is prophesying, it goes into spiritual gifts, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If in serving, let him serve. If it's in teaching, let him teach. If it's encouraging, let him encourage. If it's in contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it's in leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing a mercy, let him do it cheerfully. See the things that are created? If you apply it to men, the work that God has begun in you will be completed when your gift is being used to full capacity. Sometimes I, I feel bad and sometimes that all of our gifts aren't being used or the opportunities to be used as much as you can use it. Because next year at this time, there's no guarantee you'll still be here. But has your gift been used for the glory of God? Amen. That's the truth of it. Amen. Got quiet in here. <laughs> Sometimes old school mindset is well, we'll let other people do it or we'll let our wives do it. Our women are supposed to do certain things. God forgive us for that mindset. It's not biblical. It's certainly not New Testament. There's some Old Testament things and if we were Jewish, there'd be one way that we would treat women. If we were some other types of Eastern religions, there's a way you treat women, etc., etc. But not in the church that's full of the grace and the mercy of God. Amen. There's an appreciation for those called our spouses, our loved ones, our wives, our girlfriends, whatever it might be that's in your life. Secondly, accept what God is doing. That's the main thing I think that's hard for us sometimes is to believe that God is really using me and accept the fact that God is using me to do what he wants to do in my life. Doing his will, doing good work in you is accepting the fact that yes, he is at work in me. If you can say that in your spirit today, yes, he is at work in me. Accept the fact that God loves you so much. He cares about you so much that he is working out his good work in you. It's kind of like you have to see it like a, putting a jigsaw puzzle together. One piece at a time is kind of boring or sometimes challenging. You look at the one piece and you can't see the whole picture of what's going to be completed until it's all put together. And that's what God's doing in your life. Sometimes we as men try to see our lives just as one piece and we don't seem to be that effective or mean much in our lives or it doesn't going to do much in our lives or until we see the whole picture when it's all done then we know that God has worked his work in our lives and it's good and it's good in our lives except the fact that God is at work in your life I accept it I participate in my home I participate in life I accept what God is doing in my life. And then men, all of us, back to Philippians, we have to come to the place to where we are feeding your minds with the right kind of food. Feeding your minds with the right kind of food. 
Paul says again in chapter 4, if you go to verse 8 now, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. That's the mind food that you have to dwell upon. Do you see what Paul is saying to the church? Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely. If I ask you today what books you've been reading, or what magazines you look at, or what TV shows you watch, or what you do on your phone when no one else is around, the articles you read, men, this will determine what you're feeding your mind with. And it's important that every one of us, every one of us men, the fathers that are present here today, we need to feed ourselves on the truth of the scripture. How much Bible do you read? How much time do you spend letting God speak to you? And prayer is important not only to pray a prayer, but wait for God to speak back to you. And he often does that through his word. But you have to open this thing once in a while. You have to dwell on it. You have to take it. It is the bread of life. It's everything that you need to satisfy you. And if you're not reading the word, if you're not feeding your mind with God's word, then you are missing out on what God wants to say to you. Because he speaks through his word, the written word that is before all of us here today. His mind food that he gives us. The fourth thing is feed your spirit. If you feed your spirit, you'll find that you'll come up with contentment. The results of spirit food is contentment. What do I mean by spirit food? Well, let's look more at scripture, can we? Look real quick with me to these scriptures. And down in uh, verse 10 now, for, uh, well, in verse 9, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. And he goes on to say in verse 10 down, let's go down to verse 11, I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content Whatever the circumstances, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Feed your spirit with the word of God and it will bring contentment. I want you to notice one thing that Paul emphasizes in the NIV version four times and he says it this way. Contentment is learned. Contentment is learned. It's something that takes time for you to be at peace with yourself and be content with that which is God's plan for your life. All of us need a dose of contentment. And it comes from our spirit. Our contentment is soulish. And it has to be learned. Peace is one of the gifts of the spirit. And it's given to us by the power of the Holy Spirit. The fifth thing I want to share with you. I just talk to you about participating. I talk to you about accepting who you are in God and that he's doing a good work in you. To feed your mind upon those things which are of God as we just read that whole list in Philippians 4. And also to feed your spirit which brings contentment. I know if you're living in the spirit, I know the Holy Spirit's working in your life if you have contentment. If you are anxious or discontented, then you probably have a spiritual lack in your life. So men, you want to know God's will for your life? He wants you to learn contentment. And the last thing, 
I think it just, nothing else I share with you today, and I'm going to close. This whole idea of seeing a need. He says in verse 14, Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as your Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintances with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. The church at Philippi saw a need that Paul had. I'm going to, this could be a sermon all by itself, but it's so powerful, church, if we can grasp what he is saying. The need to see the need. <laughs> the need to see the need is taking place. Not one church except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. Not that I am looking for a gift, but I am looking for what we credited to your account. I have received full payment and even more. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epidatus the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to his riches and glory. King James coming out of my mouth here. Riches and glorious riches in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. The point I want to make on seeing the need is this. Did you know there are 18.3 million children today in fatherless homes? 18.3 million, according to 2022 census. There is a need for fathers in the homes of America. You wonder why our nation is crumbling it's because of this tragedy. 90% of all runaways are from fatherless homes. 90% of runaways are from fatherless homes. 85% of all children who show behavioral disorders come from fatherless homes. It's all right, Ezekiel can do what they need. Oh, it's Jonathan. All right. They're misbehaving. There must be a sign here. No, bless your heart. Thank you. That. Think about this. 63% of youth suicides are from fatherless homes. When I started reading these statistics, my heart came to the place of there's a need. We never talk about it. How can we save a child from suicide? How can we save a home and keep it together so there isn't the tragedies of misbehaviors or abuses? 85% of all children who show behavioral disorders come from fatherless homes. Ma'am, you have a challenge. Some of you are grandfathers. Your responsibilities haven't changed. Great grandfathers, your responsibilities have not changed. We have to see that there's a need, and these generations of young children that God is blessing us with need us to be able to see that they hurt. Like Philippians saw that Paul needed something to help him with his ministry. 
They were moved with compassion to give their last nickel to help his ministry. What are you willing to give to save a child's life? What are we as a church willing to do? To find and search homes. The empty home that's empty from a father. And try to fill the gap that God gives us the ability to change the world by one child at a time. There's a need. 18.3 million children across America who live without a father in the home. I tried to find some statistics on Lane County in Crestwell on that actual term. I couldn't find one. But I do know that if there's one out of every four children are fatherless in the United States. One out of every four. Fathers, do we have some challenges? Yes. As men, do we have some challenges? Yes. That's why today we look at ourselves and we say, I gotta participate. I gotta be more present in my home. Yeah. In the homes that will allow me to be what I can be. The homes that will allow me to be an influence, to be there, to accept my responsibilities that God has for me, to feed my mind and my spirit with that from the Word of God that will help, help me be all that I should be. And then see the need, like the Philippians saw, and be moved with compassion to fulfill. Father God, thank you. Thank you that you give us the opportunity to be all that we need to be in today's world. Lord, we're not perfect, but we desire to be used by you to meet the needs that are all around us. Show us doors. Show us opportunities open doors that you provide for us, that we may have eyes to see and ears to hear what you are saying to us that we as men of this church, Walker Church, can respond and be the answer for a dying world. And may we say, be led by the Lord to save one soul and lead them to the knowledge of who Jesus just one. Thank you, Lord. Let me just tell you this story. Lord wants me to share this with you. Some of you know that Charcy and I adopted a little Indian girl back in 1965. Her name was Jody. Our desire was, and we saw the need, so I practice what I'm preaching. The Lord just reminded me while I was praying, Jody was saved, came to know Jesus by living in our home. We left the Yukon when we were pastoring, and that's where she was born, Dawson City, Yukon Territory. And she lived with us until she was 17 years of age, and she died in a car accident in the highways in Southern California. But before she died, she had put on her bulletin board in her bedroom. And I still have a copy of the goals in her life. And one of the goals in her life was to lead someone to Jesus without saying a word. At her funeral, 30-some young people made their ways to an altar and gave their heart to Jesus about Joey saying one word. But it all began by seeing the need 
in our small community of the Yukon and help these small children who are being taken in and out of foster care and needed a place to go. One time we had three children in our home from foster care. We kept Jody, we adopted her, and brought her to the United States. She was the head of her missionette group, which is a girls' scout type thing in church, if you're familiar with missionette. She loved Jesus, but led someone to the Lord without saying a word. Today I ask you, I believe with all my heart, there might be needs next door to you down the street are in the schools that your kids or grandkids go to. Somebody needs Jesus. And it's our responsibility to say, Lord, we don't need a loud voice from heaven, thus saith God, all we need to know from the Spirit being awakened in us. There's compassion for the life of an individual. What can I do to plant the seed that will change them for all eternity? It's your desire to be used that way. Would you just kind of, with me, respond to the Lord in prayer? Lord, we see the needs. Men and women alike here in this service today, we see our world, we see the loneliness, we see the aches, we hear the suicides, we hear so many youth that find no hope. Give us the opportunity to share hope with someone. Give us the opportunity to see that our neighbor or the children in our neighborhood, our own family relations, our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, whatever it might be, nieces, nephews, help us to see that they need you and give us the opportunity to plant the seed of salvation. We pray this. As a group today, Lord, in Jesus' name. Everyone said with me, Amen. Amen.